Hey, in today's video, I want us to talk about a phenomenon that I can only describe as simping for capitalism. I don't know if that's a thing, but it's definitely a thing I've seen online. I mean, if you have been politically active and you have expressed your political views online for the past few years, you might have noticed a weird phenomenon where people that are clearly not rich, like super rich, they will still fight for the rights that benefit the rich and will look down on the rights that will benefit the working class, like social security, Medicare for all, lifting the minimum wage. And of course, if you're anything like me, you might become extremely frustrated at this weird thing because how can you be against something that benefits yourself? So that's what I want us to talk about today. How did we get here? Like, why does such a big part of the population in the United States specifically, will fight against things that will benefit them in the long run. And I'm gonna be honest, like I feel like I don't have an a solution to this problem, so this video is more of a discussion, because I think sometimes even just venting your frustrations and sharing them with people that think alike actually helps you heal and in the long run helps you find a solution. So let's just get started and let's talk about how we got here and how, in my opinion, the Republicans brainwashed the poor into being capitalist simps. First of all, if you look at the history of the United States, clearly the settlers and the founding fathers are essentially colonizers. Despite what white supremacists will like you to believe when they say that their ancestors are from America and so they're pure-blooded. Um, no, Karen, your ancestors are immigrants and like i said more specifically they're colonizers and if we look at the history of colonialism especially the english would use a tactic called divide and conquer and let me just say that none of the what i'm gonna say in this video is like groundbreaking i'm just putting ideas together for the sake of like exploring my own frustration and venting my feelings okay <laughs> Back to divide and conquer. Divide and conquer is a phenomenon in which the colonizer attempts to divide the populations of a country, which are usually multiple different ethnic or racial groups, and you attempt to sow discord between those groups of people, so those groups of people never get together against the colonizer, and thus never have the power, the numbers, the resources to overthrow the colonizer. And of course we know from history that that is exactly what the colonizers of the United States had to do. They fought and pushed and terrorized really Native Americans until little by little they had very little of their land, very little of their resources, very little of their culture left. So much so that there was so very little labor that that's why slavery became to be such a huge resource of wealth for the United States. They had no labor force. Essentially built their country on the backs of slaves. And the, one of the biggest reasons why the United States became to be such a huge force during the industrial age was because of their use of slaves. And the crazy thing is that this tactic is so successful that to this day, there's so much hatred and racism between our groups in the United States that we still have not managed to come together against the oppressive government, which are no longer colonizers, but they are still oppressive authority figures and still you have so many groups of people just wanting to fight amongst each other instead of uniting against the oppressive government and that is just the early history of the united states and debate all that you want and i can't wait to read all the karen comments telling me how how dare i say that their ancestors are immigrants but that is exactly what happened now Another little phenomenon that I have really been surprised by during my lifetime is the weaponization of language and socioeconomic policies. One example of this is something that we now for some reason know as the death tax, but really it was the estate tax up until sometime in the 1990s. And let me just quickly explain the estate tax so we're all on the same page. 
First of all, the estate tax only affects rich people because it says that when you die and you leave your inheritance to, you know, your your children or whatever, you are going to get taxed on that inheritance left for the next person. Well, somewhere along the way, the estate tax became known as the death tax. And of course, that sounds a lot more like incendiary. Why would you be taxed for dying? Well, it turns out around the 1920s, we see the first instances of when the oil tycoons wanted to hold on to their money and they started this campaign to want to eliminate the estate tax. And so they started to call it the death tax in order to get people to believe that it would affect them. And this was not very successful. However, there was a big resurgence, according to the professor of law and economics, Michael Graetz at Yale. And I apologize if I mispronounce that. There was a resurgence of this woman in the 1990s where they, once again, wanted to rename the estate tax into the death tax. Except, unfortunately, this time it was successful. And a lot of poor people, working class people, to this day, believe that the death tax actually applies to them, when in actuality it does not. It applies to the very, very rich, and it will never impact, in actuality, it will help the poor and the working class if the rich are taxed on, this, on the money that they leave for their, for their children. Another very similar instance of this that we all know about, most of us know about, is trickle-down economics. The economic theory that if you tax businesses less and rich people less, then they have more money to invest more on businesses and create more jobs, buy more things, stimulate the economy, and therefore the money will trickle down to the people at the bottom. Well, that has been completely 100% disproven. When you don't tax businesses and when you don't tax the rich, they actually hoard their money. And I mean, if you want any more proof of this, just take a look at worldwide statistics at how much money the rich have versus how little the poor has. Because if the trickle-down economics actually worked, you wouldn't have Jeff Bezos with ready to be a trillionaire any day soon and most of America, about 40% of America, probably probably more now that we have the coronavirus. I mean, before the coronavirus, the statistic was that 40% of Americans lived under poverty. Can you even imagine now that most people don't have a job? And then another huge instance of this type of phenomenon is the phrase, pulling yourself by your bootstraps, which I didn't really think about this phrase too much until Alexander Ocasio-Cortez mentioned it on... I don't know if it was on her Twitter or on an interview, I'll pull it up, but pulling yourself by your bootstraps is actually an impossibility, yet somehow that phrase has caught on to mean that you just need to get yourself together and try really hard and work really hard, but it's literally impossible to pull yourself up from your bootstraps because literally gravity will hold you down. And of course, this goes perfectly along the side of the American dream, which we discussed in my previous video, is clearly dead if it ever even existed in the first place, which is again based on merit and how if you just if you just try hard enough, you will you will do whatever you want. If you're a millennial, you know twice now in your lifetime that is bullshit because we are now on our second economic downturn, our second depression, because they didn't want to name the 2008 depression a depression, so they just named it the Great Recession, but it was really a depression, and now we're on our second one during the coronavirus. Anyway. And of course, looking back now in 2020, it's so easy to see how these ideas have spread out in the population with, you know, propaganda machines such as Fox News, telling you every single day to hate poor and black people, for example. And of course, now we know from the whole Cambridge Analytica slash Facebook fiasco that now they have used social media to weaponize whatever information is in front of us as well and target very specifically people that are more easily influenced and they can push over the edge to believe whatever they want us to believe. 
And for me, another layer of this is basically ostracizing the poor. For whatever reason, we really villainize the poor. And there's a lot of people, when you start arguing with them online, that will act as if it's poorest people's fault if they're poor. And so again, I looked a little bit into this to see what it's about. And so I found this article written by the professor of law, Michelle Gilman, at University of Baltimore, where she essentially lays out three myths of the poor that the Republicans have continuously fed to their constituents so that they can hate the poor and thus never back policies that actually protect and further construct the social safety net. The first myth is that people on welfare are takers. And of course, there's that stereotype of welfare queen, which is a very racist portrayal or of black people, especially on welfare. When in actuality, if you take a look at welfare, according to Michelle Gilman, one of the requirements for welfare is that you must be employed. The second myth that she cites is, again, this idea of meritocracy and that the people that work really hard will just rise to the top. Well, in actuality, she says, the top 20% of the rich will always remain rich. And the lowest 20% of those poor will always remain poor. And it's like, okay, well, what do these people have in common? It's the lack and abundance of resources. Because let's think about a rich person that never does anything. They're still going to have wealth. So it's not really merit, merit that is keeping rich people at the top. And even poor people that try really hard, and I'm sure you know people that work multiple jobs, try really hard, and they're not rich just because they work multiple jobs or try really hard. Just like if you take a look at homeless people, there's actually very little to no rehabilitation programs that will take a homeless person back into functioning society. Like, let's say somebody becomes homeless and they don't have mental health problems and they don't have drug problems. They're not criminals. There are very few, if any, rehabilitation programs or a program that will help you step by step to get back to where you were. So, And of course, the third and final myth is, again, related to racism. There's the stereotype, especially like I just mentioned previously, the stereotype of the welfare queen, the stereotype that most people on welfare are black or brown, when in actuality, Michelle, uh, Professor Michelle Gilman says, the truth is that most welfare recipients are actually white. And in a sense, I can understand why rich people would want to do this, why would rich people want to keep the poor at the bottom, but my question is, why do Republicans do this? Why would the politicians want their own country to remain stagnant? And for that, we have to look at 2020. And what are most of the Republican politicians being accused of is, well, we're working with Russia. Let's talk about Russia for a little bit. By now, some of you might have heard of the word geopolitics, but let me just explain a bit really quickly. Geopolitics is the study of the effects of Earth's geography, human and physical, on politics and international relations. So essentially, long story short, sometime after the Cold War ended, basically Russia figured out that it was way cheaper to create chaos and bring down a country from within than it was from the outside, which is via, you know, physical violence and war. And of course, that makes so much sense. I mean, what is Trump and basically Moscow, Mitch, and every other Republican being accused of, of being in bed and committing treason with Russia? And Russia is not the only player. With the death of Epstein, we basically know that our biggest ally, Israel, is basically has also been basically blackmailing us through their honeypot operation which was Epstein and by the way no I am not suicidal and by the way I'm just a young girl making videos and this is all for alleged purposes and for just having fun on a historical like level it makes sense but on a human being level in 2020 
How can it make fucking sense still to some people? In the middle of a worldwide pandemic, how can I still be getting stupid comments from people saying that we don't deserve healthcare? Or that no, McDonald's deserves to keep all of their money and they shouldn't raise the minimum wage. Or that Jeff Bezos deserves to have every little bit of his fortune even though all of his workers are the ones that have created his fortune and that have really built out his business, not to mention his, the destruction of all other mom and pops and mid-sized businesses, which Amazon has essentially killed. And I've said this in some of my other videos, there was actually a study that said that people actually hold on to their beliefs more strongly the more that you try to convince them of something else because it makes them feel like they don't have any integrity if they just change their mind. But in the last three months, I think we've seen a couple of instances in which people have had to change their minds. Like for example, all of those stupid people that still don't believe in the coronavirus and they lead anti-mask movements, they lead reopening movements just to be afflicted by the disease. And then they have to admit to themselves and the public that actually you want to take this seriously. We also have people like the farmers and the coal workers, which are now finally coming to terms that Trump never wanted to help them and basically betray them and use them for his own campaign. And I guess what I'm really trying to say is that it's going to be a long, hard road until many of these people basically convince themselves to change their mind. They're going to have to go through like real deep like thinking and analyzing of themselves and their life and what's really actually going on in the world before we can like convince them to change their mind unfortunately and like i said at the beginning of this video i don't really have a solution and which really frustrates me but i really wanted to bring all of this information to you and ask you what do you think about all of this have you been thinking about similar thoughts have you been encountering people on social media and the crazy thing is is that we don't even know if you're actually talking to a real person or you're talking to a bot on social media which is why now i, I just don't even really bother trying to explain stuff to people because i feel like i think you're a bot like i don't know I don't know if people can be this dense sometimes, but maybe that's like a mean way to handle it. I don't know. Let me know your thoughts, comments, opinions. Do you think I jumped anywhere past any like key points in all of this? Let me know in the comments of this video. I really want to hear your thoughts about it. And yeah, that's all I really wanted to talk to you today. Of course, if you watch my videos, if you subscribe to this channel, I know that you are most likely not simping for capitalism. And most likely you're just like me, you're frustrated with these people and you can't understand why they just haven't come to terms with the idea that actually having social safety nets will help them. Like if you actually want to be rich one day, having social safety nets will help ensure that you even have the possibility to ever even attempt to escape poverty. And yeah, we're so close to hitting a thousand subscribers, you guys. We're about 70 something people away. And I haven't said this in a while on my channel, but of course, I will still do my giveaway when we hit a thousand subscribers. I still haven't decided what I'm going to give away, but I will announce it in my next video because we should be hitting that number pretty soon. Thank you so much to all the new subscribers. Thank you so much to the subscribers that have hung around through all the changes in my videos because it took me such a long time to just embrace who I am and what I actually want to do <laughs> or like how I want to say it so thank you so much you guys um like I said let me know your thoughts and comments subscribe if you like to continue talking about world domination and I'll see you in the next video I hope that you're staying home safe because like I said on my last few videos the coronavirus has not ended despite what the greedy ass people in government want us to believe so that we don't ask for more money so I hope that you've been taking care of yourself, taking precautions. Please wear a mask, you guys. It doesn't matter if you feel like you look stupid. Just wear a mask, please. And I'll see you in the next video.